Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Mouse and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be covering another unsolved case for my Curious Case series. Unfortunately, I'm currently in a house where there is some building works going on next door. So if you hear any of that during the course of this video, I apologize in advance for that. I just like to point out this video is not being made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just being made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Now with all that being said, Let's delve right into this case. On the 16th of September, 1922, 23-year-old Raymond Schneider and 15-year-old Pearl Barmer were out on a walk. And they were out on a walk at about 10 a.m. near New Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce that place name. It was while they were out on this walk that the pair would stumble across two bodies lying underneath a crab apple tree. And these bodies were found on Derusi Lane. The two bodies were that of a man and a woman. The woman's head was resting on the man's right arm with her left hand resting on his knee. I'm gonna put up a picture right now on the screen from the crime scene. So if you're sensitive to images that are from crime scenes, then please look away now. I will say when it's fine to look back again. As you can see on screen, a Panama hat covered the man's face. It looked to the investigators as if the pair had been killed first and then repositioned after they were dead. Okay, so the image is now off screen now. You can scroll back up from the comments and continue watching the video. Shocked and horrified at what they had come across, Raymond and Pearl ran to the nearest house. And that house was the house of Grace Edwards and together they all phoned for the police. Police officers Edward Garrigan and James Curran were dispatched to the scene. And when they arrived, they surveyed the crime scene for any evidence. The two bodies had been discovered fully clothed, which told the investigators that this attack's motive was most likely not that of a sexual nature, as in someone hadn't raped the victims and then murdered them. The man and the woman had both been shot to death. The woman's throat had been slashed and a business card was found propped up against the man's left foot. The business card was that of Reverend Edward Hall. A dark leather wallet was also found near the bodies, which had the driver's license of the Reverend Hall in it. The driver's license was used to then verify the identity of the male body to be the Reverend Edward Hall. The woman laying next to him was soon identified to be Eleanor Mills. On the 14th of September 1922, just two days before the gruesome discovery of the bodies, Eleanor Mills had walked over to a neighbor's house to return a telephone call that the minister of her church had made to her. Eleanor was now in her 30s, and she had married a man called James Mills in 1905 when Eleanor was just 15 years old. Keep in mind that marriages at such an age at that time were pretty commonplace. Together, James and Eleanor had two children, and they were called Charlotte and Danny. Eleanor was a consistent and enthusiastic member of her church, and she'd actually been going to this church since she was about 14 years old. Now, nine months before the gruesome discovery of their bodies, in December of 1921, Eleanor had surgery to have her kidney removed. Unfortunately, James and Eleanor couldn't both afford to pay for this surgery, which I believe the surgery would be a life-saving surgery. I think she had some kind of issues with her kidney. So Eleanor went to her church's minister, and this minister was Reverend Edward Hall. The Reverend agreed to pay for the surgery in full, and then James and Eleanor Mills could then pay him back in installments. When Eleanor rang the Reverend back on the 14th of September 1922, the topic of discussion was this medical bill that she was paying back and they decided on the phone that they needed to meet up in person to discuss the bill. So once she had hung up the call, Eleanor returned home. She put on her hat, a scarf, a shawl, and then decided to leave. And she left her four-room apartment at about 7.30 p.m. on the 14th of September, 1922. Strangely, Eleanor didn't tell her husband James or either of her now teenage children where she was going. She just kind of walked out of the apartment and left. She left the apartment, jumped on a tram, which she rode to the end of its line, and then got off. And then she walked towards DeRuzzi's Lane in New Jersey, about five blocks or so away from Eleanor's home. The Reverend Edward Hall had just finished eating his dinner, and he had been dining with his wife, Frances, and his wife's 
brother, Willie Stevens. The Reverend and Francis got married on July 20th, 1911. And when they got married, the Reverend was 30 years old and Francis was 37. At the time of this crime being committed, the Reverend was 41 and Francis was 48. The couple lived in a two-story red brick mansion, which was just a few blocks away from the church where the Reverend was a minister. At about 7.30 p.m., the same time when Eleanor Mills left her apartment, the Reverend Edward Hall left his home. And when he left, he told his wife and brother-in-law that he was just popping out to meet with Eleanor Mills regarding a payment for her doctor's bill. By about 10.30 p.m. that night, James Mills, Eleanor's husband, noticed that she hadn't yet returned home. James decided to go to their church to look for her, but when he got there, she was nowhere to be seen. According to James, Eleanor sometimes went away for a few days at a time, so James wasn't particularly concerned. So James decided to go back home and get into bed, thinking that Eleanor would probably return in the early hours of the morning. But by 5.45 a.m. the next morning, Eleanor had still not returned home. Strangely, James decided not to report her missing. At around 2.30 a.m. on that same morning, the Reverend's wife, Frances Hall, knocked on her brother's bedroom door. The Reverend Edward had not yet come home and Frances had grown quite worried. Frances told her brother that she wanted him to go with her to the church to see if the Reverend was there. Willie, Frances's brother, got dressed pretty quickly and they both rushed over to the church. They stopped outside the church and noticed that no lights were turned on in the church. So they decided to go straight to Eleanor Mills' apartment and when they got there, they knocked on the door. They waited about two or three minutes but there was no answer. Nobody opened the door and there were no lights on in the apartment, so they decided to go back home and wait for him to come home, probably in the morning. They then resumed their search the next morning when the reverend didn't return. Then, that afternoon, Francis went to the police and reported the reverend as missing. Two days later, when the bodies were found, torn shreds of paper were also found around the bodies. And what was torn up? Love letters between Eleanor and the Reverend. In one of the letters, Eleanor wrote, I know there are girls with more shapely bodies, but I do not care what they have. I have the greatest of all blessings, the deep, true, and eternal love of a noble man. My heart is his, my life is his, all that I have is his. I am his forever. From these letters, it became quickly apparent to the investigators that the Reverend and Eleanor Mills were having an affair, and they had become romantically involved. No weapons were actually found at the scene of the crime. However, several cartridge shells were found, and these cartridge shells were from an automated pistol. An undertaker then took the bodies away in a hearse that afternoon. When the Reverend's coat was removed, a bullet fell to the floor. The Reverend had been shot once in the head. Eleanor had been shot three times. Eleanor's throat had also been sliced from ear to ear. Medical examiners carried out an autopsy on the pair and determined that they had both been killed at about 10 p.m. on the 14th of September, just 36 hours before the bodies would be found. The medical examiners also determined by judging the entry angle of the shotgun wounds that the Reverend had been shot by a person standing over him. On the 18th of September, just two days after the bodies were found, more than 200 mourners showed up to the Reverend's funeral. The next morning, only a handful of people showed up at Eleanor's funeral. The subsequent investigation initially suspected that James Mills, Francis Hall, and Francis's two brothers, Willie and Henry Stevens, were all involved in the killings in some way. Francis and her brothers were repeatedly questioned by investigators. As it turns out, many of the people that went to the church already knew of the romantic affair that the Reverend and Eleanor were having. However, James Mills and Francis Hall both categorically denied having any knowledge of the affair initially. Three weeks before Eleanor's kidney surgery, the Reverend had actually sent a single red rose flower with a love note to Eleanor's home. Now, Francis Hall's brother, Willie, was also known to have a very short and fiery temperament. Willie also owned a .32 caliber revolver, but he claimed that the gun hadn't been fired in over a decade. The cartridge shells and the bullets found in the bodies and at the scene of the crime were all .32 caliber. And when the police examined Willie's weapon, they agreed with him. The, 
the gun was in no fit state to be firing any weapon and definitely hadn't been used recently. So they returned the gun back to Willie. Now Francis's older brother, Henry Stevens, was actually a firearms expert. Henry had once been an exhibition marksman and actually lived about 50 miles away from the scene of the murder. The police were making very, very, very little headway in this case. However, on the 27th of September, the courts approved an application to have Eleanor Mills's body exhumed for further examination. When the body was exhumed and examinated, it was confirmed that she had been shot three times in the head. Her head had actually been nearly decapitated due to the throat slash which went from ear to ear, with her windpipe and her esophagus both severed. Two .32 caliber bullets were removed from her body. Some sources also report that her tongue had been cut out, but I'm unable to completely verify whether that's true or not. One week later, on the 5th of October, the Reverend's body was also exhumed. However, when examining the Reverend's body, no further evidence was found. The police then offered up 1,000 US dollars for any information leading to a conviction in this case. This reward would never be claimed. Now, like I discussed in my video, the Lawson family case, and if you haven't seen that video, I'm going to leave a link to it in the iCards. People in those days would flock to a scene of a murder or a severe crime to collect souvenirs. And this case was no exception. Souvenir hunters actually ripped out the old porch of the house on the property where the two bodies were found, with one person even pulling a window pane from the house. More souvenir hunters actually broke into the house and started destroying furniture on their quest for souvenirs. As you can imagine, the souvenir hunters were severely impeding on the investigation. Interestingly, on the 2nd of October, the investigators found out that Francis Hall had actually sent some clothing to Philadelphia to be dyed. A clerk at the dyeing factory told the investigators that Francis Hall had sent them a couple of garments to be dyed black on the 20th of September, just six days after the double murder. The dyeing company then dyed the garments black and returned them to Francis four days after she sent them in. Why was she dyeing these garments? Was she trying to get rid of some stains? Were they blood stains? What was on these clothes? A week later, the police then decided to interrogate Raymond and Pearl, and if you don't remember who those people are, they are the couple that originally discovered the bodies. They also interrogated two of their friends friends, Clifford Hayes and Leon Kaufman. Pearl told investigators that Raymond had brought her home at about 9.30 on the 14th of September, the day that the Reverend and Eleanor went missing. When Pearl got home, it turned out that her father was drunk. So Pearl's father asked Pearl whether she would go with him on a walk to try and walk off his intoxication, to which Pearl agreed. At about 10.30 p.m. that same evening, Raymond had met his friends Clifford and Leon outside the local theater. That is when they noticed Pearl in the distance walking with a drunken companion. The group of boys grew quite jealous, specifically Raymond and Clifford. So the group of boys decided to follow Pearl and this companion. Clifford was so jealous that he actually took out his pistol from its holster and said that he was going to fight the man that was accompanying Pearl. The group of boys followed Pearl into the park, but they had actually lost sight of Pearl and the companion. So the boys went into the park and started to look around for them. After a short while, they realized that they had completely lost sight of Pearl and the companion. So the boys gave up and left the park and started walking around the neighborhood looking for Pearl. Finding nothing, they then returned to the park at about 11 p.m. The prosecutor originally theorized that Clifford had been in love with Pearl. The prosecutor then went on to theorize that that Clifford had come across the Reverend and Eleanor Mills in the park and then shot them in a case of mistaken identity. The prosecutor believed that Clifford thought that the Reverend and Eleanor Mills were Pearl and the mystery companion. The mystery companion who we know is actually just Pearl's dad. All of the boys were heavily interrogated by the police. And with this theory as the base of the investigation, Clifford Hayes was arrested in connection to the double murder on murder charges. The police failed to explain why Clifford had cut Eleanor Mills's throat from ear to ear, why he would have posed the bodies like they were found, and why he would have scattered love letters around the two bodies. As you can imagine, the public was not convinced in the slightest that the police had arrested the right man. In fact, one of the detectives tried to walk the four blocks 
from the train station to the courthouse and when he was doing that the public started following him shouting abuse at him and then started throwing rocks at him four days after Clifford's arrest the charges against him were dropped and he was subsequently released. The police then turned their attention back to Francis Hall, Francis's two brothers, James Mills, and James's and Eleanor's 16 year old daughter, Charlotte. Strangely, Charlotte, who was Eleanor Mills's daughter, had actually sold a packet of her mother's love letters to the media for $500. But as no other evidence was found, the police were left stumped. Then, on the 24th of October, a new witness came forward. And this witness was called Jane Gibson. Jane Gibson was a 50-year-old woman who lived with her son on a 60-acre hog farm. Jane Gibson told the police that she was widowed and that her husband had been a minister. Jane also told the police that dogs began barking at about 9 p.m. on September 14th. And this actually drew her attention to a person standing in a cornfield. Jane suspected that this person was stealing her corn, so she mounted a mule and rode off towards the suspected thief. She followed the thief into De Russie's lane. And that is where she saw four people at the scene of the murder of the Reverend and Eleanor Mills. According to Jane, there were two men and two women stood underneath the crab apple tree. Suddenly, there was a sound of a gunshot and one of the people fell to the ground. Jane told the investigators that she heard a woman cry out, don't, don't, before there were more gunshots and another person fell to the ground. Jane then decided that she should probably flee at the scene, so she did. And as she did, she told the police that she heard a woman scream out, Henry. Jane also told the police that she had been trying to tell the police all this information, but they completely ignored her. They told her that they weren't interested, and this was probably due to the fact that they had just arrested Clifford, and they were chasing that as a lead. However, Jane's story did not match the police evidence or the autopsy report. And this is because the autopsy report showed that the Reverend had actually been shot with the person that shot them standing over them. And Jane's account depicted the Reverend being shot where four people were just stood in a group. Jane was dubbed by the media as the pig woman due to her living on a pig farm. And Jane actually started adding more details to her story in her second interview with the police. She told investigators that she saw a touring car parked at the scene of the crime. The headlights of a second passing vehicle allowed her to get a good look at the four people that were stood under the crabapple tree. She told the police that one of these four people was a woman in a long coat, and another person was a man with bushy hair and a dark moustache. Interesting to note, Willie Stevens, Francis's brother, had bushy hair, and he had a moustache. Jane then told the investigators that she heard one woman say, how do you explain these notes? Jane then added that Eleanor Mills had tried to run away from the killers, but the killers caught up with her and dragged her back to where the Reverend had been shot. Jane said that Eleanor was then shot three times, which is a fact that matches up with the autopsy report. Now in a third interview, Jane claims to have returned to the scene of the crime at about 1 a.m. And this was because she was trying to go back to retrieve some shoes that she had lost when she had fleed the scene originally. When Jane approached the crabapple tree, she said that she saw Francis Hall, the Reverend's wife, kneeled over the Reverend's body, crying and howling and weeping loudly. Neighbors to the scene of the crime told the police that they didn't hear any gunshots, they didn't hear any screaming or any shouting or anything that matches up with Jane's witness statement that night. Interestingly, when Jane spoke to these neighbors the next morning on September 15th, Jane didn't mention any of these murders and didn't seem to be shook or moved by anything that was going on or disturbed. Jane was further discredited after it was discovered that she was not actually a widow of a minister. Her husband was a toolmaker who was very much alive and well. A lot of people believe that Jane Gibson just wanted the 1000 dollar reward that the police had posted. In November of 1922, Jane Gibson claims that Henry Carpenter, Francis's cousin, was the shooter. However, Henry had a very solid alibi. Henry told the police that he'd been having dinner with his wife and some friends until about 10.30 p.m. on 
the 14th of September, and the police rolled Henry out as a suspect. On the 20th of November, a grand jury was convened. They heard from 67 different witnesses and adjourned for five days without making any indictments. According to some sources, the case was reopened four years later in 1926, and there was even a trial, but nothing ever came of it. Henry Carpenter was never tried. Interestingly, the crab apple tree where the bodies had been discovered no longer exists. Souvenir hunters had actually cut the tree to pieces, including its roots. And they had done this the first weekend after the double murder had occurred. And that is really everything we have in this case. Let me know in the comment section down below what you think of this case. It is very, very strange. The lot of questions that I have and I wish there was more available on this case. I think it is strange that James Mills didn't report Eleanor as missing and didn't seem to be too concerned about her whereabouts. I do believe the pig woman was simply in it and making a witness statement for the $1,000 reward. And a part of me believes that Willie Stevens, Francis's brother, was somehow involved. Or Francis's older brother, Henry Stevens, was involved because he was a firearms expert and he didn't actually live that far away from the murder. Although in those days, it would have taken a lot longer to travel 50 miles than it does in today's day and age. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case True Crime series. If you're new here, I upload two videos every week, one on Wednesdays, which is a random, usually quite funny, lighthearted video, and one on Sundays, which is my usual Curious Case True Crime episode. I'm gonna start uploading my Sunday videos now more in the afternoon instead of uploading them in the evening because I get some people telling me that they get too scared to watch them when it comes out straight away so I am going to be uploading those in the afternoon. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post and you can be notified when I post in the community tab any updates or polls to do with my true crime content. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next video. Eleanor Neal, Eleanor Neal, Eleanor Mills had walked over